Hey everyone, welcome back. In the first two videos, we spent a lot of time looking at what happens inside a single box. We looked at the physics of software, the L1, L2 caches, the way the CPU interacts with RAM. We looked at the math of scale, how we use distributions to understand our performance. But there's a massive elephant in the room. In modern system design, your code almost never runs in a vacuum. Your service is part of a giant screaming nervous system of other services, databases, and caches. And this is where most engineers lose their way. They fall for what I call the fallacy of the local call. Let's look at my screen for a second. If you're a junior or mid-level engineer, you might write code that looks like this. To the person writing this, it looks clean. It's just three lines. You call a function, you get a value back. It feels local. But as a first principles thinker, you have to look past the syntax and see the physics. When you call db.fetch user, you aren't just jumping to a different memory address in your RAM. You are launching a physical signal. You are packaging data into electrons or photons, sending them through a copper wire or a fiber optic cable, hitting a switch, hitting a router, going through a firewall, entering another machine's kernel, and finally reaching another application. I want to ground this in the numbers we learned in video one. If an L1 cache hit, the fastest thing a CPU can do takes about 0.5 nanoseconds, Think of that as one second in human time. A local RAM hit around 100 nanoseconds would be like three minutes, but a network call within the same data center, that's roughly 500,000 nanoseconds, 0.5 milliseconds. In our human scale analogy, that network call isn't three minutes, it's 11 days. Imagine if every time you reached for a pen on your desk, it took one second, L1 cache, but every time you wanted to check your phone, you had to wait 11 days. You would organize your life very differently, wouldn't you? You wouldn't check your phone 50 times a day. You would batch your questions. You would try to avoid the trip entirely. Yet, in our microservices architectures, we make these 11-day calls constantly, often inside loops, because the local call abstraction hides the tax from us. Today, we are going to look at the line items on that tax bill. Okay, so let's get into the nitty-gritty. What makes the network so expensive? It's not just the distance, though the speed of light is a hard limit we can't beat. It's the tax that the operating system and the protocols demand at every step. Before you can even send a packet, you need an IP address. You have a host name, like api.payments.internal. Your computer doesn't know what that is. It has to check its local cache. If it's not there, it sends a UDP packet to a DNS server. That's a round trip. If that DNS server doesn't know, it asks another one. Even in a well-tuned system, DNS resolution can add 1 millisecond to 10 milliseconds of pre-work before your request even begins. Next one, the connection tax, the handshake. Now you have the IP. You want to use TCP because you want reliability. TCP is a stateful protocol, but the wire is stateless. To create the illusion of a connection, you have to do the three-way handshake. You send SYN. The server sends SYN ACK. You send ACK. That is one full round trip, RTT, where you have sent zero bytes of application data. You're just shaking hands. If your RTT to the server is 50 milliseconds, you've spent 50 milliseconds just saying hi. The cryptographic tax, TLS. But wait, it's 2024. You aren't sending data in the clear. You're using TLS, HTTPS. After the TCP handshake, you now have to do the TLS handshake. This involves exchanging certificates, agreeing on a cipher suite, and generating session keys. In TLS 1.2, this took two more round trips. TLS 1.3 has optimized this down to one, but it's still more waiting. And don't forget the CPU cost. Your CPU has to perform RSA or elliptic curve math to verify those certificates. This is compute tax on top of network tax. Last one is the kernel tax, context switching. 
Now, let's look at what's happening inside the server. Your application code lives in user space, but your network interface card is managed by the kernel. When data arrives at the wire, the kernel receives it. It then has to copy that data from the kernel's memory space into your application's memory space. This is a syscall. Your CPU has to stop running your code, switch to kernel mode, move the bytes, and switch back. This context switch is expensive. If you are doing thousands of small requests, your CPU spends more time switching between user and kernel modes than it does actually processing your business logic. A lot of high-performance networking, things like DPDK or eBPF, is essentially an attempt to bypass this wall, to let the application talk directly to the hardware to avoid the kernel tax. But for most of us, we're paying this tax on every single packet. And congestion. Finally, there's the invisible tax. The network is a shared resource. If a switch in your data center gets congested, it just starts dropping packets. TCP will eventually notice and resend them, but now your one millisecond request has become a 200 millisecond request because of a timeout. This is the tail latency we talked about in video two. The network tax isn't just a flat fee, it's a fee that randomly jumps by 100x because of someone else's traffic. So when you see that simple line of code, user equals db dot fetch user ID, I want you to see this whole checklist. DNS, SYN slash ACK, TLS handshakes, kernel copies, and potential retries. It's a miracle it works at all, honestly. In the next part, I want to zoom in to the most wasteful part of this whole process, how we actually turn our beautiful objects into strings of text. We're going to talk about the serialization crisis. All right, let's talk about something that sounds boring, but is actually one of the most CPU-intensive things we do in distributed systems, serialization. Think about it. You have a beautiful, structured object in your RAM. Maybe it's a C++ struct or a Python class. But the network doesn't understand objects. The network only understands a stream of bytes. So you have to serialize that object, flatten it out into a string of bytes, and then deserialize it on the other end. Now, for the last 15 years, the default for the entire world has been JSON. And I want to show you why, from a first principles perspective, JSON is a disaster for high performance systems. Look at this JSON on the left. To you and me, this is great. I can read it, I can edit it in Notepad, but let's look at what the CPU has to do to read this. First, the CPU has to scan the string, character by character, looking for those double quotes. It has to find the key ID. Then it sees a colon. Then it sees the characters 4 and 2. But wait, the CPU doesn't do math with the characters 4 and 2. It needs the binary integer 42. So it has to run a parsing routine to convert that string into a number. Then it hits an array, brackets. It doesn't know how big that array is, so it has to keep scanning until it finds the closing bracket. Every time you parse a JSON, you are performing a massive amount of string manipulation and memory allocation. You're creating new strings for the keys, new objects for the values. In a high traffic service, your garbage collector, if you're using Java, Go, or Python, is working overtime just to clean up the trash left behind by the JSON parser. Now look at a binary format like protobuf or flatbluffers. In protobuf, we don't send the string ID. We assign ID to a field number, say 1. On the wire, we just send a single byte that says field 1 is coming and it's a 4-byte integer. The CPU doesn't parse this. It just copies those 4 bytes directly into a register. There's no string scanning. There's no ambiguity. If you look at the internals of something like gRPC, which is what Google uses for almost everything, it's built on protobuf. The communication tax drops significantly because you've moved the work from complex string parsing to simple memory copying. But if you want to go even deeper, look at flat bluffers, used heavily in game development and at companies like Netflix. 
Flat Bluffers is zero copy. The data is structured on the wire in the exact same way it's structured in RAM. You don't even deserialize it. You just map the network buffer to a pointer and start using it. When you're operating at scale, the choice between JSON and Protobuf isn't just about preference. It's about whether you want to spend 30% of your CPU budget just parsing strings. Now let's zoom out from the CPU and look at the globe. This is where we hit the hard ceiling of physics. We often talk about latency as if it's a software bug we can fix, but a huge chunk of latency is just the speed of light. Light in a vacuum travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. In fiber optic glass, it's closer to 200,000 kilometers per second because of the refractive index. If you have a user in San Francisco and your server is in London, the distance is about 8,500 kilometers. A round trip, SF to London and back, is 17,000 kilometers. The absolute physical minimum time for a photon to make that trip is about 85 milliseconds. You cannot beat this unless you find a way to warp spacetime. But remember our handshake tax from earlier? Let's see how it compounds with the speed of light. If you are using standard HTTP 1.1 over TLS 1.2, TCP handshake, one round trip, 85 milliseconds. TLS handshake, two round trips, 170 milliseconds. HTTP request and response, one round trip, 85 milliseconds. Total time before the user sees anything is 340 milliseconds. To a human, anything over 100 milliseconds feels like a delay. We've already tripled that, and we haven't even run a single line of database code yet. This is why the development of QIC, HTTP3, is so important. QIC is a first principles rethink of the network stack. The engineers at Google and Cloudflare realized that TCP was built for a world where connections were rare and long-lived. In the modern web, connections are frequent and short. QIC combines the connection and encryption handshakes into one. It says, I know you want a secure connection, so let's do the TCP and TLS math at the same time. In QIC, that 340 millisecond wait can drop down to 170 milliseconds or even 85 milliseconds for repeat connections using zero RTT. This is the practical takeaway. When you are designing a system that spans the globe, your primary enemy is not the database, it's the number of round trips. If your front end has to make five sequential API calls to load a page, and each call requires a new handshake or a separate round trip to a distant server, you have failed the physics test. This is why we have CDNs, content delivery networks. We move the handshake closer to the user. We put a server in SF so the 85 millisecond trip becomes a 5 millisecond trip to the edge. The edge server then stays warm and keeps a long-lived connection to the London server. We are essentially caching the connection tax. We are trying to trick the speed of light by reducing the distance the signal has to travel to say hello. Okay. Let's look at how the pros handle this tax. If you're a small startup with 10 users, you can afford to be sloppy with JSON and unoptimized TCP. But when you're Discord and you're handling millions of concurrent users talking to each other in real time, the communication tax becomes a multi-million dollar problem. Discord is a fascinating case. They have this gateway service. It's the entry point for your phone or desktop app. Behind that gateway are hundreds of microservices. Early on, they realized that if service A calls service B and service B calls service C, and they're all using standard REST and JSON, the tax was eating them alive. They switched heavily to gRPC. The magic of gRPC for Discord wasn't just the binary serialization, protobuf, we talked about. It was HTTP2 multiplexing. In the old world, if a service needed to send 50 different updates to another service, it either had to open 50 connections, which is a massive kernel tax, or it had to send them one by one. HTTP2 allows you to send all 50 requests over one single TCP connection at the same time. You pay the handshake tax once, and then you just keep the pipe open. 
This is what we call connection pooling. Now let's look at an even more extreme example from the data science world, Apache Arrow. Let's say you have a massive data set in a database, like ClickHouse or Snowflake, and you want to pull it into a Python machine learning model. Usually, the database has to serialize the data to a format like CSV or JSON, send it over the wire, the Python side has to parse it and turn it into a NumPy array. This is 90% tax and 10% work. Apache Arrow changed the game by defining a standard memory layout. The data on the disk, the data on the wire, and the data in your RAM are identical. This allows for something called zero-copy deserialization. When the bytes arrive at your network card, the OS just maps that buffer directly into your application's memory. There is no parsing step, no conversion step. The tax is effectively zero. When people talk about big data being fast today, they aren't talking about faster CPUs. They're talking about eliminating the communication tax through shared memory formats. So, we've covered a lot of ground. We've looked at the speed of light, the cost of handshakes, the messiness of JSON, and how the kernel gets in the way. How do you use this to become a better architect? It comes down to one first principle. The most efficient way to communicate is to not communicate at all. If you can't avoid it, then follow these three rules to minimize the tax. Instead of asking for a user's name, then their avatar, then their bio in three separate calls, ask for the profile in one call. If you're updating a database, don't send a thousand insert statements, send one batch of a thousand rows. You pay the network tax once instead of a thousand times. This is the single most common optimization that yields a 10x performance gain. We've been told for a decade that microservices are good, but from a physics perspective, microservices are a tax nightmare. Every time you split a service, you're turning a free local function call into an expensive network call. If service A and service B are constantly chatting with high frequency, they shouldn't be two services. They should be one. Keep the data close to the compute. Design your interfaces to be chunky, not chatty. A chatty API requires the client to know too much and ask too many questions. A chunky API allows the client to say, give me everything I need for the home screen, and the server, which has low latency access to the database, assembles it and sends it back in one high-density package. When you're building your next system, don't just think about the logic. Think about the logistics. Every time you see a dot in your code that represents a network hop, I want you to visualize a dollar sign leaving your bank account. If you respect the network tax, your systems will be faster, your AWS bill will be lower, and your P99s will be a beautiful flat line. In the next video, we're going to follow a single packet from a user's phone all the way to your gateway. We'll look at DNS, BGP, and the edge to see how the internet actually holds together. I'll see you then.